I always like to point out that Biosphere 2 was inherently a beautiful project. So if you're going to start thinking about a biosphere, let's give you a stunning image and spectacular uh, mini biomes to relate to. I mean, that's why we're not only going to have an ocean, even though it's so hard and everyone says it can't be done, we're living coral reef in there. We're going to not just have a wetland. We're going to have a microcosm, a truncated 20 miles of the Everglades, you know, packed into 200 feet. We're going to have a tree <laughs> forest with a mountain and waterfall. I mean, it, you know, living in Biosphere 2, and I love the Earth, but living in Biosphere 2 is amazing. Greetings, future fossils. This is Michael Garfield welcoming you to another episode of the podcast that explores our place in time. Just last night, I was recording an episode with Eric Davis, one of my great inspirations for episode 99. So keep your ears open for that one. And we were discussing how one of the characteristics of our weirding age is the paradox in which progress has led to a condition of ahistoricity a moment in which all moments occur at once, in which all previous technological systems and cultural matrices coexist, in which all stages of human development co-occur and have to find their way together. And in this mashup of the full spectrum of human possibility, it's becoming increasingly possible that we've been here before, that we're not actually at the cutting edge or the prow of the ship of time like we have been telling ourselves for so long, but that much like it would be with any other fractal, identifying our location in the fractal of time is no clean task. And I feel that very strongly in conversations like the one I had with Mark Nelson, of which this episode is part two. Mark's claim to fame is as the CEO of the Institute of Ecotechnics, the group that built Biosphere 2, the most daring and ambitious ecological experiment that I'm aware of, and was one of the eight Biospherians who lived inside this closed ecological network, this microcosmic simulation of Earth for two years. And it's crazy to think that this came and went while I was still in grade school, that bizarrely, some of the most sophisticated and wondrous achievements of human science lie squarely in our past. I mean, we're not just talking about the moon landing here, although we are talking about a technological achievement that is in some ways more impressive than the moon landing. But this conversation with Mark really reinforces for me why I do this show in the first place. And that is to minimize the chances that you and I and the generations that come after us are going to reinvent the wheel unnecessarily, are going to repeat the same mistakes as those before. I'd like to believe that even in this time of confused temporal orientation, that there's still an opportunity for us to accrue wisdom across generations, learn from those who have come before, walked this path, seen past where we are seeing now, and have performed the vital duty of reconnaissance for us. And I'd like to believe that we can participate in that activity of iterative reconnaissance in some meaningful way especially when it comes to the great work, as I understand it, of taking more responsibility and accountability for our role in the technologization of the biosphere, the transformation of the evolutionary process and ecological complexity into a phenomenon with which humans have a direct and immediate and deliberate involvement And in that sense, I really do believe that Biosphere 2 is one of the most important and most underappreciated events to have occurred during my life, something that history will remember as at least as significant 
as all of the other moments that have entered collective memory in this time. An accomplishment of human ingenuity and creativity that perhaps never got the attention it deserved because it was too wise, too attentive to the non-human intelligence that surrounds us in this biosphere, too aware of the complex realities of the challenges that face us as we turn our attention to space and life beyond this blue marble, too integrated in its understanding of the relationship between art and science, between creativity and discovery, between scientific experimentation and human life as a theater of possibility. And so it's with great pleasure that I bring you part two of this delightful conversation. But first, I just want to give a quick thanks to everyone who has been supporting this show on Patreon, including this week's two new patrons, Derek Stackhouse and Kevin Wolmet. I love you both. Every single person who throws two, five, ten dollars at this show or whatever every month, this show is my labor of love. It wouldn't happen without your support. I have so far managed to keep from selling you out to advertisers in order to keep Future Fossils episodes coming out on a regular basis. And while I would love to find more aligned sponsors interested in making larger contributions, it remains, for now, an entirely crowdfunded, bottom-up, emergent phenomenon. And for that, I do everything I can to shower you with interesting goodies. If you sign up at patreon.com slash Michael Garfield, and even if you don't, there's a ton of free stuff up there that I hope you will visit and enjoy. Also, as always, a huge thanks to everyone who has been subscribing, rating, and reviewing this show wherever you listen to podcasts. Everyone who's been sharing this show with their friends, Even though the premise of this show is that its largest audience is still unborn, I sure do like feeling as though we have an active, living, listening audience. And hearing from you folks in the Facebook group, getting your emails at futurefossils at protonmail.com, these things really encourage me and help me make sure that I still have my finger on the pulse and that I'm producing episodes that means something to you and that's a huge thing for everybody so thanks everyone and if you want to reach out to me for any reason you know how and that's that thanks again so much for listening and enjoy the rest of this conversation with mark nelson And I'm curious, what do you think it was? Because it's always something in the zeitgeist, right? There's like a a receptivity or a sensitivity. And we're at the early 90s and there's Captain Planet, you know, and like it's the first time people are talking about the importance of recycling. But yeah, so what do you think it was that? Well, I think it touched a nerve around the planet. I mean, and I I always like to point out, you know, so so people said, and it almost became sort of a standing joke, that Biosphere 2 is 50 years ahead of its time. But the reality was that, you know, the, the operating of a managing company was called Space Biospheres Ventures. Mm-hmm. And when I say that, at first, I, you know, I was a director before I got motivated to become part of the Biosphere and candidates. You had to spell Biosphere like three or three out of four or four out of five times. People did not know that word. Mm. Sustainable was not being used. And Biosphere 2, you know, so, and it started with some European magazines. I mean, literally, it was true. I mean, if you want to make a tourist attraction, you don't make it in southern Arizona because four months of the year, it's in triple digits. And, you know, tourism has a very limited space. So we did think it was going to be a quiet research facility, exciting as hell. We can get back to how exciting creating Biosphere 2 was. We, and we do have to get back to the noosphere. Yeah. But we had made an architectural model of Biosphere 2. So this first, I think it was Geo or 
some such magazine out of Europe, took it outside the building and put it up against the mountains. And for all the world, it looked like we had already built Biosphere 2. And that image started, you know, ramifying and it started getting picked up. Uh, and I think there was a, like a global nerve. And, you know, when you're, you're, when you're involved in a project, uh, I thought all of our projects were cool and I still think they are. But you know, none of them tapped a worldwide audience like Biosphere 2 did. And I think it's a testimony not to the genius of John Allen or Ecotechnics. It was because somehow or other people were hungry for a way of relating to humanity and our biosphere. The, you know, this is, you know, it was in the sidelines waiting to take center stage. And I always like to point out that Biosphere 2 was inherently both a beautiful project. So if you're going to start thinking about a biosphere, let's give you a stunning, a stunning image and spectacular uh, mini biomes to relate to. I mean, that's why we're not only going to have an ocean, even though it's so hard and everyone says it can't be done, we're living coral reef in there. We're going to not just have a wetland, we're going to have a microcosm, a truncated 20 miles of the of the Everglades, you know, packed into 200 feet. We're going to have a tree <laughs> forest with a mountain and waterfall. I mean, it, you know, living in Biosphere 2, and I love the earth, but living in Biosphere 2 is amazing. And it was also, as go, we'll go back to the noosphere, to make it to where that could be a laboratory that could be studied, we had to ensure that there was no pollution inside. And I've lived in the outback of Australia. That's probably as clean an environment as I've, I've had before the two years in Biosphere 2. Incredibly. Uh, so, yeah, so something about the beauty of it. But why it was inherently optimistic was, again, ecotechnics. It was the greatest experiment in ecotechnics, how to bring together, and we needed so much technology if you're going to make an artificial biosphere. And such a diversity, it was just stuffed with life. If we can bring those two together, and that to me was, in addition to comparative biospherics, the real virtue of that project, it was going to be a laboratory for figuring out how to make eco and techno dance in a beautiful way and not harm each other. Why do you think there hasn't been a Biosphere 3? Like, so much has changed and advanced. And like you said, you know, even just the fact that there is now a world stage in a way that there wasn't before the web and that, you know, it seems like a project like this now would have so much an easier time finding the funding, finding the, you know, the, the, the personnel, finding the creative and intellectual capital to make it happen. Why isn't it happening? What, what, what is wrong you know, with us? Well, first off, it did, it did inspire, well, it was vilified in the mass media. We can go back to why Biosphere 2 was threatening. Uh, you know, there was no automobile in there. there was well, let's no, start that, yeah. Yeah. But, but I did want to point out that the Japanese, who may be the most, I think there was something about the island psychology. You know, if we were followed elsewhere pretty heavily, I mean, they think a billion people watched the re-entry at the end of the two years when we came out. It in Japan, we were rock stars, and the Japanese were studying Biosphere 2, and they built, you know, for a good while, it used to be called Biosphere J, either for Junior, because it was a little bit smaller, or for Biosphere Japanese. Mm. So they, in fact, have a pretty advanced uh, system up in northern Japan. Uh, I'm going to be going to speak next week at the Eden Project, and Tim Smith, totally inspired by Biosphere 2. And the theme of, you know, that's not a closed system, but the theme of that project, which is the biggest tourist attraction in Cornwall, is the cooperation and the symbiosis between plants and people. So beautiful themes. Kew Garden, uh, Ian Prance, now Sir Ian Prance, you know, brought New York Botanic Garden in the Bronx to work on Biosphere 2. He was a rainforest designer. Then he became the director of Kew Gardens. Well, Kew Gardens and a lot of other botanic gardens started putting in systems that were inspired by Biosphere 2. Chris, making a closed system is expensive and it's difficult and it's got inherent uncertainty. But, you know, I don't think uh, I, I should point this out. When we talked about 
comparative biospherics. We thought Biosphere 2 was going to be one of quite a number of other ones. Biosphere 3, 4, 5. The Russians were totally planning that until the Soviet Union imploded and they, they wound up being bankrupt. But our cooperating institutes were the leading ones in space medicine, et cetera, environmental studies. They wanted to make a Russian biosphere, and listen to this, they wanted to, to start out with it being polluted. The uh -huh. opposite of Biosphere 2, they said, look, the Soviet Union, we've had no control over polluting industry. You know, our soils, our water, our food, everything is contaminated. But, but to me, that's a testimony, and I, I still think that this is in the cards. I mean, Biosphere 2 is $200 million. That, and that was because a lot of it was first off doing research. You know, if we had to build another one, it would be less expensive. But you can do it in so many different ways. So, OK, so the Russian one would have been a polluted biosphere. And what they would have studied would be ways of cleaning up the water and the, and the air and purifying uh, food. You could make temperate uh, biosphere, too, because we're in southern Arizona, you know, uh, to minimize, and it was still energy consumptive like crazy, we had, we made a tropical biosphere. You know, you could do one in the Scandinavian countries and, and include, you know, temperate and, you know, alpine, tundra type of biomes. You know, so the, the palette is not finished. And even in space life support, now there's two groups in China with big backing from the Chinese government that are really taking the field, you know, beyond what the Soviets had done back in the 70s and 80s. So, you know, on fronts, things are happening. I mean, and I also think that optimism is a yoga. Mm -hmm. And you want to do your hatha yoga and keep in shape. Despair, you don't want, you know, despair is like screwing off and not meditating. We don't need to meditate today and for, forget the physical exercise or hatha yoga. Optimism is important psychologically because it tells you I can make a difference. And this is all going to work. Now, it may be irrational, but if you give in to despair, you're basically, you know, all of the hormones and, and emotions are going to tell you that it doesn't matter. So forget about separating the recycling. And I have to say that was another thing that Biosphere 2 really illustrated. You know, again, you know, compared to Earth, it was so small and, and cycles were sped up. So there's a famous example you know, we would sit in our command room where we had, you know, there was like over a thousand sensors. So we could see CO2, almost a real time graph. We could tell before we went to a window to see that a cloud had come between the sun and the light coming into Biosphere 2. We had one gas that continued rising after we closed and there was a lot of construction and the engineer said it's, it's either going to be a PVC, a you know, plastic pipe, glue or solvent. We fanned out and in a corner of, you know, I, I hopefully you'll post some pictures of Biosphere 2 so people get an idea of the scale. There was one small like pint or half pint bottle of solvent and it wasn't open. It had been cross threaded. So it did not make a perfect seal. And that tiny escape of gas being registered, we had a very sophisticated analytic laboratory. So in Biosphere 2, you know, and when I first met the Russians, I sent them boomerangs. I was working in Australia because, it, you know, thinking about it, <laughs> the whole system, everything comes around. It's like a boomerang, but it happens really fast. So Biosphere 2, you know, one of the mantras in addition to you know, we would tell ourselves the health of this biosphere is our health. It's pretty much, you know, we're all in this together. And the other thing in Biosphere 2 that was so palpable, there were no small actions. If you improved an irrigation system and plants started growing better, that would be reflected in our atmospheric balance. We'd say, OK, but to do that, that irrigation, we have to use some PVC uh, glues or solvents. We would check with the analytic people and see where the levels of those trace gases are. And I'm convinced that if people in cities around the world got, in addition to the smog forecasts and, and readings, a list of all the stuff that's been found in their food, 
and the stuff in their air, depending on, you know, how many cars and how many, what type of industry is around, that would raise some consciousness. <laughs> that, totally. That Daniel Schmachtenberger talked about this on the show in episode 51, actually, talking about how uh, specifically to this notion of despair and the sense that we are overwhelmed by input from all over the world, uh, you know, news of tragedies happening everywhere all the time. But we have no we like we have the sensory system, but we don't have the muscular system that allows us to respond in a in a, a, a meaningful way right, right now and that there is you know to scale up that building as organism thing to meet the gaia hypothesis piece of it it seems that like whoever i talk to there's this common strain of having to find a ways to use technology to make visible these measurements to basically empower us with new senses so that we know how to act in this space that like, you know, that the, that we can see, you know, those, those tight little loops of feedback. How do we shrink a planet sized situation down to a level where you can actually experience the consequences of your actions? And like you see people talking about, doing that with um, like using blockchain so that you can audit the supply chain for a product that you're buying so that you can see every factory that every component of it comes from and then like make ethical decisions about your, your, you know, your purchases like that. And I don't know, there's just something, something really sort of, that seems to be a really key innovative piece of this. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, empowering people, I mean, and I think industry has every reason not to tell you because, <laughs> you know, in fact, you know, there was so much, so much research, but what's in, done in Biosphere 2, but one that's popping to my mind is we had this really cool study with some biochemists, you know, collaborating with the, uh, the laboratory work we're doing inside. And they were looking at toxins and pollutants in the Biospherians' bloodstreams. And everyone expected, well, you know, you're stepping into such a clean environment that everything's going to go down. The opposite <laughs> happened. And, you know, it's again, you know, things are complex because we're eating this calorie restricted nutrient diet, which our doctor was totally overjoyed about because he'd been working with this with laboratory animals. And, you know, he, he projects, he wrote a book called 120 year diet that it has tremendous health effects. But one of the consequences of having uh, such low fat in our diet, we came out, I think the men were actually lower than professional athletes in the amount of body fat that we had. So uh, unanticipatedly, body fats is where uh, pollutants that we've been exposed to get released. So it was really interesting in general, those things were being released and in some cases, thinking one of the crew members, uh, I think I'll protect her anonymity, but she had worked in India and in some developing countries that were using nasty chemicals long after they had been banned in the West. So people were seeing DDT and, and you know, other chemicals that, you know, seem to be, you know, um, artifacts or you know, <laughs> far distant uh, past things. So, yeah, so, so kind, of, kind of interesting. I, I did want to go back because now I'm on the, the story of pollutants, yeah. to lay out a little bit more, and, I, and we should talk about the Anthropocene, or the Anthropocene, as, as whichever you prefer. Yeah. But Vernadsky, so Vernadsky not only you know outlined how the biosphere operates, and what an amazing, um, powerful engine of change it is, the force of life, but he also very clearly saw that uh, this disharmony between the technosphere and the biosphere. So he and a few other people, and you know, for whatever reason, Teilhard de Chardin is far more known, but there's several of them who were in Paris, Frenetsky was teaching at the Sorbonne in the, in the 20s, came up with this idea that the next phase of human evolution or the evolution of life on our planet is the noosphere. And noos in Greek means intelligence, so what they were seeing, were, and Vernetsky really, you know, didn't have a mystical interpretation. He very clearly thought that humanity, because of our unprecedented impact on the biosphere, 
would have to get to the place of intelligently regulating their actions to bring it in harmony. I think he used the word that, you know, humanity needed to become a conscious creative agent of evolution instead of this Dennis the Menace character running around enamored with this technology and discovering, oh my God, we've killed a rainforest or my God, people are getting sick over there. Yeah, so I mean, so I think that, and I, I, I think that the Anthropocene is a very good recognition. So if your listeners haven't heard this, this is the idea, and, and it's being debated that the geologists may declare that we are living, the modern era is not the Holocene, the recent era, it's actually the Anthropocene, because of the amount of Earth's resources that are flowing through human economy and populations and the impact of all the byproducts of our technology. And, and technology, I include agriculture and ranching. Uh, so, yeah, so... And some people have kind of taken this as, as, oh, no, now we're really doomed. But I think it's kind of a recognition not too far out. The, the consequence of recognizing that we are, Vernatsky had a colorful way. He said humanity is basically a geologic force mm -hmm. because of the strength of its numbers and technology and ability to move matter. So the noosphere and learning to live intelligently Kind of coming of age in the Anthropocene. This is the challenge of our time. And as you're saying, if, if we built Biosphere 2 now, we could have, you know, saved a lot of breath that press releases and interviews, because I think it'd be really obvious why an experiment, the experiment wasn't, you know, how rainforests function. It's about basic processes there and whether humans, technology, and our agriculture we should talk about the Biosphere 2 agriculture, hmm. how it can be compat compatible with the rest of the living systems. So we gave the, the engineers, you know, their basic instruction was your technology has to meet the screen, the, you know, the test. Will it produce anything as a byproduct or pollution or whatever that the biosphere can't handle, recycle and make harmless? And all the technology that goes in there is its primary job is to support and enhance life. And so in pushing our limits, the obvious thing is that sounds like a kind of good program for technology <laughs> and engineers. Why don't we do that out here? So back to revolutionary, you know, the sad fact is that power possessors and a lot of money is made on doing things in the dirty, nasty, polluting way that got assumed, you know, for whatever reason at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. They never understood that technology was going to be so powerful that belching smokestacks, which was a sign of progress in the 19th century, now people look at them with kind of horror. So we're in a totally new uh, era, and it's not you know, as they say, rocket science, <laughs> to redesign our technosphere. And if people were empowered by understanding, it's not innocuous that that chemical plant is spewing out synthetic chemicals because we can measure it in our bloodstreams, we can measure it in the air, we can measure it in the food chain, the fish that we're eating. You know what I mean? The more that, that people know, there are consequences to the type of technology that we permit to operate on planet Earth. So Biosphere 2 is very revolutionary. And to me, it was so interesting when, you know, the power struggle happened, the facility was donated to Columbia University to run. One of the first things they did was get the people out. Let's get back to the paradigm that scientists in, in white lab coats are studying the rainforest, not studying how we live and our technology lives with the rainforest. And for God's sake, let's get rid of that agricultural system. So this is a good, this is a spot that I'd like to, something that I've been wanting to have you discuss here is the fall of Biosphere 2. And there's something specifically in this discussion of the tight loops and Biosphere 2 as a microcosm of the, of Biosphere 1, including people, including technology, and including the modern project, which I, I was just talking with Zach Stein who wrote a really interesting piece about 
restoring a metaphysics of love in, in what uh, people are calling the meta modern philosophical movement the you know beyond post modernity which is in some sense just an like a, a juiced up hyper version of modernity and its emphasis on the this individual and our you know irreconcilable differences and all this stuff he makes this really interesting point about how modernity was upset and is obsessed with externalizing as many costs as possible financial costs emotional costs you know make it somebody else's problem is like the motto of the last 500 years and at some point in the 20th century we can kind of like a lot of people have pinned it to the atomic bomb and the recognition that the radioactive fallout doesn't stay in Japan. It gets everywhere. Uh, like you were talking about, you know, the, the DDT in Biosphere 2. That now we, you know, we've gotten to a point where modernity was really great for building things to shut things out. But now we've covered the whole planet in this Anthropocene technosphere. So we're basically all indoors. And now it's not about shutting things out. You can't shut things out. And the meta modern project is to acknowledge, recognize, and re internalize all of those costs to like see the actual full cost accounting of everything that we do. And so this is where you're talking about like the, uh, the resistance that you experienced, you know, between this essentially meta modern project and the modern world in which it occurred and the, you know, you specifically mentioned the, the agriculture and so on as a piece of that and sort of ant antithetical uh, worldview or philosophy. And I, yeah, just love to hear you talk about why this was clashing so powerfully and, and, and how it went down and whatever you're, I know that a lot of this has been kind of a touchy subject over the years and, you know, some of it may not be subject to public conversation but whatever is <laughs> you know before we before we get there i wanted to add to you know the modern predicament and uh, in doing research for pushing our limits i ran across it and my partner knew that the phrase solastagia was coined by an australian environmental psychologist and it's a combination of nostalgia and solace sadness mm. and he describes it more or less as the sadness that people experience when a beloved place, landscape, city, community goes downhill, is degraded. Mm. And I think it's near universal, especially among the earth. We are all not inside. There are still a lot of people out there working on land, etc. But I get your point, and I'm, I'm certainly from that culture. And there's also this, this term, it's not a clinical term, neither is solastagia, but nature deficit disorder. And I think that, you know, among the, uh, well, I don't want to use the malaise, the famous uh, word that uh, got Jimmy Carter in problem. But I think that, you know, the dissatisfaction that a lot of urbanized humans, uh, modern humans experience is because that, you know, this is a new situation in human history. We've o always been, prior to the Industrial Revolution, pretty close to nature. And you know, if you'd said that to a caveman or a Neanderthal or whatever, you know, would you stop making that, that emotional, artistic m masterpiece? Let me ask you how you're dealing with nature deficit disorder. They w would have looked at you in incomprehension. So I always like to emphasize the, you know, the kind of the positive uh, aspects of changing and change we will and change we must my hope is that the changes are positive and not further down the, the roads that uh, you know that uh, the timelines that we know the dismal ends thereof you know that we have all the world to regain you know and, and I, I do think it's you know that back to the pessimism and I, I totally understand I don't like the word environment environment kind of perpetuates that you know here we are and there's something alien and foreign that's the outside of us that's part of that schism that in fact is maybe an artifact of language but i think it's also an artifact of this modern 
you know, segmented. We're going to become specialists. We're the human economy and technology. It doesn't really. We we need those the nature for raw materials, but what happens to the bio? You know, all of that, all of that schism. I think is killing people. I think it's not fulfilling our lives. I think it's it kind of a base cause of a great deal of why modern people, you know, are not as exuberant and ebullient and are subject to despair because we have depauperized ourselves by cut, you know, by cutting ourselves off from the environment. So in Biosphere 2, yeah, you were bringing up wastewater gardens. I fell in love with that recycling system we had for all of our shit, all of our piss, all of our laboratory waste, our animal waste. It was all into a beautiful constructed wetland. All the nutrients were going back. We were not degrading and, you know, s- disposing of our of our waste somewhere else for something else to deal with. It was a beautiful system. I totally fell in love with it. And I, I, we had worked with Billy Wolverton, a great NASA maverick and uh, environmental engineer who was a great pioneer, both in indoor plants for cleaning up air quality and constructed wetlands and I decided to make them biodiverse and call them wastewater gardens. And I love them because they connected people at a very micro scale to part of their interaction with nature. I mean, I always like to point out when I make talks, you know, find out, you know, when you open that faucet, where is that water coming from? What's its history? When you when you run some water down a, you know, toilet or a drain, find out where it's going. You know, maybe it, it'll be a great adventure you know, if you've put in a constructed wetland or you have a more enlightened city, it may not be terrible. But again, this is kind of like finding out what's in your air and water and, and food is basic information. And you'll be more connected. So what I really loved about putting wastewater gardens in is that would work like a charm. My, my favorite example, we did a lot of projects. It was payback to Acamal, Mexico. It's a, a town a couple of hours south of Cancun where we collected the coral, coral reef. And we were told by people who were divers and, you know, there's a lot of ecotourism there that they have this huge sewage problem. So we decided to go there and do these wastewater gardens to, you know, keep, you know, take all that waste that otherwise people are little, literally swimming in and with and create beautiful gardens with them. Uh, Billy Wolverton, though, opened my eyes to indoor air quality, and his point was the one you were making. We, you know, modern people spend an amazing amount of time, 90%, maybe in some cases, 95, you're either inside your house, inside your, your place of work, or in your car. And he was saying indoor air is, you know, like 50 to 100 times worse than outdoor air pollution. Mm. So the spinoffs that we had, and that was one of the, you know, so... Making a recycling system, we knew that we would have to come up with innovative eco technologies. And the two that I like to point at, because they're they're kind of very cool. One of them to do with how to how to safely treat wastewater and turn it into give us shit. You know, we make flowers for you and fodder for the animals. And the other one is uh, using the soils to purify the air. Again, champion slime. You know, mm-hmm. coming to rescue. And that was one of the products that we were going to do. So we were so worried about buildup of trace gases. Again, you make something that tight. If you do have trace gases build up, you're in big trouble. So we luckily, you know, contacted some German engineers and professors at the University of Arizona and Connecticut. And it's it's much more t- known in Europe. But uh, sewage engineers and nasty industrial plants giving off odors had this idea, let's take the exhaust, the stinky air from the factory, and run it through the bare soil around the factory. And magic. They expose it to the soil microbes. The soil microbes feast on what otherwise is causing odors. So we made the entire farm. The farm was not only the most productive half acre ever run by humans. Of course, we had some advantages. Uh, and it was completely beyond organic in its cleanliness, and we recycled all the nutrients. But we also engineered it to be a giant soil biofiltration unit. So if we had buildup of trace gases, we could have pumped all of the air of Biosphere 2 through the agricultural, rich, diverse slime and microbe, you know, life-abundant soils in 24 hours. 
Wow. So again, you know, redesigning the technosphere, solving, you know, this can be done and there's money to be made. But I think it's going to be a pitch battle because there are vested interests that, you know, are making money on the destruction of our biosphere, which has its concomitant factor in the degradation of human health. I mean, when I did the research, I was really surprised to find air pollution is the number number seven killer of humans on the planet, killing them outright and shortening lives. So it's not just academic that we clean up industry. You know, this is a matter of life and death. And when I wrote my, you know, my piece on chemicals, I could virtually not sleep at night. I mean, it's really scary. And the EPA in all of its history has banned less than five substances. Most of these chemicals go out without even any screening. Seriously. So yeah, meta, meta modern. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, Oh, so, brave new world. Oh, indeed. So, uh, yeah. So you've got this extraordinary, sophisticated, wise system in, insofar as it is. And people misunderstand this thing about science. Like, oh, it didn't do, you know, it, this thing, you got a negative result or whatever. Therefore, the experiment failed. No, no. It's clear that this was a successful experiment in comparative biospheres. But you get to an end of it, and what I've heard is, you know, the, the project was destroyed, it was smeared in the media, the soils were, were like, actually ripped out and killed. Like, wh what? <laughs> who, who, uh, who did you piss off? Uh, okay. <laughs> I want to, in a way that I hope is not too wonky and pedantic, uh, there was a woman who uh, Columbia did a number. Columbia, by the way, did some really excellent research with the biomes that we were told could never be replicated and be you know, worth studying. They did some of the pioneering uh, research in the coral reef, especially, but also the rainforest and desert to show what's going to happen to those ecosystems under increasing CO2 and climate change. But they stopped it being a closed system. Uh, and so I want to kind of explain. So Rebecca Ryder was a Earth semester student. She was uh, majoring in the history of science at Harvard. And she came there and was like, how come I'm not hearing anything about the people who created this place? <laughs> so a couple of my books and John Allen's books and writings were kind of like Samizdat in the Soviet Union. You know, the, these things that would get you sent to Siberia were mimeo and passed around. And one of the, you know, I have a niece who lives in Tucson. They took a, a diagram that, that John had made of the interplay of the technosphere and biosphere from one of his books. And they made a, a, a final gift to all of the students there of that diagram. And when I saw a guy that I knew who continued working, he kind of turned white. And he said, I hope you haven't worn that to bias for two, you know, because so anyway, Rebecca Ryder, you know, did a little research and found out, you know, a number of these people are living 500 miles from Tucson and they appear not to be ghosts. You know, you can go over and talk to them. So she did a study of bias for two, which has its, you know, I have some problems with it, but but she excellently summarized the four taboos that biosphere violated according to popular conceptions of science. See, there are no taboos in science. Science is basically a really cool endeavor. It means learning about nature, how nature works. I mean, it's just marvelous. I mean, aren't we a wonderful species? <laughs> We've been talking about the down, I mean, you know, humans are, are to be celebrated. The high side of humans is, is really quite astonishing. Anyway, one of them is there's a certain way that you do science. You get a hypothesis, you run around and get some data, and you prove it true or false. And that is indeed a way of doing science. And really, unfortunately, there is a divide, you might say a scientific culture divide between the people who really look at uh, small units of nature, 
they're sometimes called reductionists because they, you know, they, they don't want to study an organism. They want to study the genome or the, the gene and specific molecules or uh, D, uh, genes on, on the, so there's the reductionists and then there are people who look at integrated systems at systems levels and even whole systems. And of course, Biosphere 2 fell into a bit of the antagonism, unfortunately. The reductionists get most of the money and most of the press. The other guys are a bit marginalized. And unfortunately, among some reductionists, there is this kind of contempt that if you're not doing science that I understand, i.e. hypothesis, we run a little experiment, change one variable, you're not doing science at all. So that was one of the taboos. <laughs> Another one is that you have to be a recognized, this is Rebecca Ryder's uh, phrase, and she's a Harvard graduate, I'm only Dartmouth and <laughs> University of Florida, but she said, you know, science has to be done by the proper ordained high priests. Mm -hmm. Now, too, in fact, although Columbia first said, you know, it's just a bunch of, you know, recycled actors from New Mexico. I mean, we had some really great scientific institutions and individuals. But the truth is, you know, we were a bunch of mavericks who said, you yeah, know, let's start an institute of ecotechnics. Let's put these ideas into play. Let's attract, make our facilities available, etc." So we were not the high priests. And she points out, once Columbia took over Bias for Two after the power struggle and the takeover, you know, that they got a free pass. No one questioned why they took out. There was apparently some pathogen. There are so many uh, things in a soil you know, and usually in nature, that's why organic farming works, is that if you have enough diversity, anyway, so they, they went crazy because they found some pathogen in the Biosphere 2 agriculture. I personally think it was, they didn't want to deal with who's going to farm it. If we only have scientists, not going to have scientists digging out the radishes and you know, cooking the sweets. That's, that's the work of actors. Yeah, right. <laughs> Low paid actors. <laughs> They need a they need a day job anyway, right? So so those are two of them, and the, the other ones are even more profound. Science has to be separated from art. Mm. The emotions have to be separated from the intellect. And I, you know, I have great admiration, and you know, one of the other things that the Institute of Ecotechnics did is it had twenty five or thirty amazing conferences, and we picked all of our heroes to come and give talks, and they were kind of off-the-record meetings. That's how we found a lot of the network that we needed for Biosphere 2 eventually. But I have the greatest respect for scientists. I never met a great scientist who was not also emotionally and passionately interested in his science. So that's, you know, completely a, a construct, you know. So I guess, you know, that, that I told you that we were encouraged to write poems and make music. You could have been doing more laboratory work, my God. And the other one, and the last one, I think, is even more tragic. And it's tragic that she identified it as a taboo. Science studies nature. Science does not study how humans interact with nature. And you think about, you know, it, we're going to need, we're going to need a huge human paradigm shift outbreak of consciousness, creativity on a scale that, you know, maybe historically the humanity has never been pushed to the edge and had to invent. And if we have, if we rule out that science, which has so much to contribute, can't, you know, study how people and technology interact with, with nature, that's the world we're living in, people. That's not just in Biosphere 2. The integration of this vast human population and all of the technologies that we use and our global biospheric system that is the reality of you know meta modern or whatever you want to call it 21st century existence i've had engineers uh michael tell me that biosphere 2 couldn't be objective because the people inside biosphere 2 were emotionally attached to keeping their biosphere healthy and in fact, you know, you know, the nerve that we touched, I loved it when Biosphere 2 started and they came in like pilgrims to the pyramids or, or Mecca, you know, the and we started having the stream. We said, okay, 
we're in the biosphere education business, so we set up tours and explanations. But I loved it that, you know, in a way, uh, I and the, the seven other people, we were a living educational exhibit. This is how people, you know, treat the biosphere and how they work with it when they know that they are absolutely integrally dependent on it. And back to a point, I'd, I'd let you get by with, you know, some of the great botanic gardens, like the, I'm going to be speaking at Kew next week. Uh, love Kew. Those are, you know, those, they may have their limitations, but they are not the control of nature. They're a way, just like we brought in exotic animals. Okay, you know, modern zoos have gotten much better than the prisons that they once were. But botanic gardens, I think, are a wonderful thing. It's like you may live in, a, you know, in England or in Missouri or wherever you are, and there's a certain beauty in the vegetation, but, you know, creating these greenhouses and, you know, the Climatron in, in St. Louis. This is like homage to the world, but it but it does bring up because one of the critiques of Biosphere Two was this is tech, technos, technophiles gone berserk. This is total human hubris because Biosphere Two is somehow trying to demonstrate that humans dominate nature. And what I really try to explain and, and illustrate in, in pushing our limits is quite the opposite. You know. The engineers were told you can't pollute it and every bit of technology, you need to tell us how it makes life better for people, for plants, for soils, for microbes, for water, you know, all of that. But all of your engineering is not going to keep Biosphere 2 healthy. What's going to keep Biosphere 2 healthy is starting with the microbes, the microbes and the fungi and the tiny insects and you know, we all learned that thing. I mean, think about what we learned in probably grade school, that one pinch of soil has got hundreds of millions of organisms, one pinch of soil. And scientists have calculated, you take all the scientists in the world, on a, let's call it a thimble fly, maybe a pinch is too small, and they could spend 10,000 years and not even identify every organism there. In fact, some of the organisms, most of them are going to be unknown to science. And at the microbe level, maybe they don't even have species. Anyway, it's the life. It's the diversity of life in Biosphere 2 that's going to make it a healthy system. And that drove our engineers nuts because the high side, and I really appreciate it, these are really creative engineers. But engineers, like when they build a bridge, they want to know that, you know, you're not going to fall off of it if you're walking on it or driving over. You know, safety of, of people is their mission. And it drove them nuts. But I had seen that when I went back to college, university, graduate school to, to work on constructed wetlands, civil engineers go nuts when they realize even in the multi-billion dollar, in some cases, sewage treatment plants, all that technology doesn't purify the wastewater. It's the microbes in the systems that the technology is providing the right conditions. So Biosphere 2 is, in fact, an incredible illustration even three acres of a mini biosphere, it's the life systems that are really doing the work, recycling the elements, purifying the air and water, and producing the food. So people had a problem with your humility. <laughs> That's sort of the, uh, the epistemic shift that we're moving in from modern into the metamodern is recognizing science not as a, pro a program of control in that, you know, like there's like wizards and witches historically, right? And the wizards are preoccupied with that sort of Faustian bargain, you know, yeah. dominance. Yeah. And the witches are all like tracking the lunar cycle and learning about herbs. And it's a very different uh, modality. And, I, you know, earlier I kind of said almost flippantly, like this, this is the return of the Black Madonna. But like that piece of it, all four of those taboos that you mentioned are taboos where we, you know, again, we're, we're, externalizing a cost, you know, or we're marginalizing a population or, or, you know, a demographic, uh, oh, you're not in the priesthood or, oh, you're, you know, you're, you're not reducing everything to a controllable simplicity or, you know, whatever the case. No, it's brilliant that you bring up Faust because a lot of people who've really looked at human mythology, Faust was the perfect uh, myth for the industrial age. And, you know, the essence of it was, you give me power, I make a deal with the devil, you know, and a certain amount of my humanity finally, you know, 
blows off his love, right? Any, anyway, the Faustian bargain is a beautiful illustration of the mindset that we've got to grow up out of because it's it's driving us to, you know, we're paying the, the cost of, the, of that deal with the devil. Of course, I would say, you know, that's kind of simplistic. But at a mythic level, I think that's that's true. I think humans need to. But, you know, I, I since the power and the exaggerated hubris that we are all powerful and we can control everything was an illusion to begin with. It's not like we're giving up any power. <laughs> no, really. Yeah. And, and I, um, you know, and even some of my friends in Ecotechnics thought it was corny. But I, you know, the last sentence of pushing our limits is, remember, we have allies. The biosphere is on our side. And I think that's so powerful and it's so true. And we're part of it. It's kind of like, would you get over, you know, you think you can't dance you know, get off the wall and, you know, get into the dance with life. I mean, really, it's so, you know, it's so true biologically, it's true evolutionarily, it's true mythically, and it's also true physiologically. You know, and a lot of spiritual traditions give up your suffering. We love our suffering. <laughs> we're, we're coming up on the two hour mark, so this is going to end up being a double episode. Which I'm I'm delighted about. It's been fun conversation. Yeah, yeah. I like I like wrapping these because it feels like we're we're reaching some sort of synthetic apex here. I like wrapping these with an invitation. You know, I'm, I'm you seem like somebody more than usually disposed to thinking of your life in light of the the greater human story. I and mean, you talk about the importance of of writing those new myths. And if we, it seems to me as though part of the new myth that's emerging is a, a, a deeper awareness of where we stand with respect to where we come from and where we're headed. And in a sense, a living presence of the past and future in this moment. And so in that way of thinking, how do you see this project within the greater human story. And then also, if you imagine yourself in a conversation with the unborn future archaeologists or historians listening to this, what do you think life will be like for them? What would you say to them? What would you want to know? Like, there's an, an opportunity to indulge in that, you know, that 15 minute Mars to Earth lag where you may, you know, you may not get the answer right away, but at least the message has been sent. Where does this take you in, in you know, those considerations? Well, you know, I think you had, you had alluded to it. So, so let's pay homage to that wonderful insight. We carry all of Earth history. We, we carry, I mean, we literally are cosmic dust. Supernova created the heavy elements, which are, you know, the reason that we have, you know, our organisms and life on Earth has that picture. I have a friend, Tyler Volk, who wrote a beautiful book about the carbon cycle and blew my mind, actually. You know, literally, you know, some of our air has, was breathed out by dinosaurs and and similarly will be breathed out by our, you know, great, great, great ancestors. I'm a little bit upset that Biosphere 2 didn't keep being a closed system. It was supposed to be a hundred year experiment because we lost weight in there and it was such an amazing <laughs> How can you lose weight in a closed system? Well, where did those atoms go? They didn't disappear. You know, uh, the, the wizard didn't literally come in and take him in a bag. No. So, the, you know, the fat that I was losing and, and, you know, my body tissue is actually incorporated in growing plants into the soils, into the corals, into the, into the air of Biosphere 2 that was, you know, rich, ricocheting around at an amazing level. So, you know, so I think we also carry our our future progeny and future life forms. You know, the, the, you know we're part of their story. Their, their future is as much part of us as that distant past. And I, I, you know, I started the book again with the homage to the astronauts. And, you know, that, that uh, transformation was put into words. There's a wonderful book called The Overview Effect. You know, that the, the astronauts, because they could see the Earth, you know, in its entirety from a distance, 
you know, they were outside the biosphere and no one had ever been outside the biosphere in that way before. So I, I started the book by saying, well, you know, I've had the, the amazing experience, lucky, lucky choice that I was the sensing element and we had the interview. So we looked out from a mini biosphere into the larger biosphere. That's why I think that though that experiment has got an enormous amount of insight, starting with, you know, very profound ones, too. I mean, there's a lot of science, but that very profound human change of how you think of that you don't think of the life inside Biosphere 2 is outside you and that you have a role. You know, so I, I hate the, the deep ecologists who say, I mean, there's a lot of profundity in deep ecology and respecting all the life forms on earth but you know people who tell me that you know humans are a cancer and a parasite on the planet i don't have very much time for that because that's such a that's beyond pessimism that is just like what you want us to be surgically removed oh yes the, the human extinction movement kill yourself now it seems that i mean that, that really does seem to be the logical conclusion of the modern philosophical project yeah so, you know, what I loved in Biosphere 2, and, and uh, there's a lot of uh, t uh, discussion of it in Pushing Our Limits, is that we had new roles. We had to be the atmospheric, the, the stewards and managers of our atmosphere. And we worked with our green allies. You know, the more green allies we had, the more food we had, the more we could control CO2. It was a number one nightmare. We were the, the keystone predators defending biodiversity. So, yeah, I mean, we're not going to just let the morning glories, which were one of our notorious invasive species, take over the rainforest and exclude the light and, you know, kill 50 or 100 species. No, we're gonna, our job is to go in and defend biodiversity. And people are doing that all over the planet, by the way. You know, all of these roles are incipiently there. Of course, in an artificial biosphere, we also had to keep the machinery going. And I think, you know, so... We had roles in there. I mean, the microbes are really great in the plants and the animals, but I don't think they were going to go and, you know, reset computers and control and irrigation systems. Not you, yet. Yet. Well, you know, more power to them. We could use allies. If they, I'm sure intelligence surrounds us. So, I, you know, I think I, what I would say to, you know, the distant, distant relative is, you know, enjoy the few molecules that, that pass through my body. <laughs> But, you know, think back to this, you know, this amazingly kind of scary, but really exciting time, you know, the beginning of the realization of the Anthropocene, this, you know, this outbreak of global consciousness that we are a planetary species, that we are biospherians and all of that. And yeah, so we took these little baby steps, just like, you know, Buzz and, and uh, Neil took on the moon. Biosphere 2 is totally baby steps in learning, you know, how to respect, to live, and to cooperate with a, a biosphere. And hopefully you're out there in the future and these, my dogged optimism, you know, has reasons, you know, to be. In your dogged optimism, what is the world that you see listening to this? Like, you know, where do you think that this is actually going to take us? Yeah, I mean, you know, Biosphere 2, I, I think it was really a landmark experiment. And I, people who really kind of get it, you know, think that it was kind of a major step. You know, Lynn Margulis and, and Dorian Sagan wrote about that, you know, biospheres are now making propagules. A propagule is a way, a reproductive unit. So I, I do think that we have a destiny in space. And... You know, you were making this point of the, evo you know, evolution hasn't stopped. We're not the crown of creation. And I think totally the, the, the two competing ones, and I quote both of them in the book, we're going to become homo ecologicus, eco, you know, ecological man. That's going to be, you know, our success on this planet. And to get into space, we're going to have to be superb ecologists. One reason that I think we should make a biosphere eventually on the moon or Mars, is it's going to teach us so much. One of the, one of the things that Biosphere 2 teaches us is, my God, look at all that technology and money and effort to make three acres of, you know, poor replicate of a little bit of planet Earth. You know, all that we're getting free from nature. 
you know, including our existence. Incredible. So, you know, if it opens up our appreciation of, my God, economics, current economics treats all of nature and resources as externalities. That means they don't take any account of it. You can't put a dollar price. This is why the fact that economists and you know, so-called economical thinking is running the world is so scary. There's a reason that ecology, ecology and economy have the same root. So any economic system that doesn't embrace and enhance, and people are now pointing to it, ecological economics, natural capital, you know, we're, to me, we are like, we've just landed on a ship of greater consciousness, you know, all of human history. And, you know, and I think, you know, humans, like Biosphere too. I think, you know, we performed really well because we were under a lot of pressure. And humans do, you know, we're, we're survivors. Every, every one, that, all your friends, all the genes in your body, they have figured out how to make it here. So I, I have infinite, you know, optimism about it. You know, we're part of the biosphere and we're not going to ecocide ourselves and our future. That's a great thing to hear from someone with experience like yours. I, I'm so appreciative that we've had this time to talk, Mark. It's I know it's been a long time coming and there's been scheduling stuff, but it's it's a real pleasure and an honor. Where, where can people find you? Obviously, you've got Pushing Our Limits, The Wastewater Gardener, but... Uh, well, I'm going to have a website, marknelsonbiospherian.com soon. Okay. It's a, it's a, and of course, there's a wonderful website uh, for ecotechnics.edu and the Heraclitus, which you know, is in great need of both material and volunteer support. It's being rebuilt in Spain, rvheraclitus.org. And through the Ecotechnics, you'll link to Synergetic Press, which is also selling Pushing Our Limits and my other books, Life Under Glass and Wastewater Gardener. And that'll be links. We should have mentioned one of our flagship projects. Again, we're, you know, we're naive. We believe that science and art, you know, belong together. They enrich each other. But one of our biomic projects is the World City and the October Gallery in London. It's a wonderful website. They, they have now 30 years of, 40 years, 40 years of cutting edge, bringing artists from around the world and getting them out of the ethnic art box into, these are just great artists from different cultures, octobergallery.co. UK, I think. Mm. Yeah, and I'll say like October Gallery just as a an appendix or pin seems to be doing for the gallery art world what Peter Gabriel and Real World Records did for world music in a way, you know, bringing all of these players together with like the WOMAD Festival and actively involved in a decades long project of, of transcultural synergy. So yeah, yet another I, cool I, thing y'all are up to. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, on the echotechnics.edu, that's a good place that'll have links to Synergetic Press, all the biomic projects. We also have a really good Biosphere 2 website, biospherics.org. Ooh, excellent. Well, thanks again so much, Mark. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been fun. Hopefully you don't have to do hours and hours of editing. Thanks again for listening. I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I did. Future Fossils is part of the MindPod network, along with Third Eye Drops, The Astral Hustle, Synchronicity Podcast, and an oodle of other fascinating programs. I encourage you to go to mindpodnetwork.com and subscribe to them all. And stay tuned, because we have some awesome episodes coming up on Future Fossils. But for now, may your now be exquisite, long, and wonderful.